Good evening. My name is Ben Wittry. I'm the chair of the Minneapolis Care and Control Advisory Board. Before we begin, I'd like to note that this meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statutes section 13D.021 and due to the declared local health pandemic. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. Board meetings and are public and are subject to the meetings are the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so that we may verify the presence of a quorum. All right. So when I say your name, please unmute yourself and say here. Ben Wittry. I am here. Adam Bennett. Here. Jamie Clermont. Here. Heather Ellis. Here. Matt Kondracek. Here. Megan Bowie. Here. And Chris Maddox. I believe he is still not here yet, so he at the moment is marked absent, but should be joining us later. All right, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, with that, we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy which has been posted to the public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. All right, so we need to have someone motion to adopt the agenda and the agenda and second it. Motion to adopt. Second it. Hey, Danielle, Danielle, can you yes. resend the agenda to me? I, for some reason, yes. when I open it, it's blank. Ooh, interesting. All right. The rest of the stuff, and the rest of the stuff works. Heather, do you want us to wait on accept? acceptance of the agenda no that's not necessary and i have the minutes i just don't have the agenda so i think i'm not not concerned about that because i did look at it and but now for some reason i can't see it anymore i must yeah. have got it gotten it um misplaced no yeah. problem yeah i just right, resent have, it to you heather we Thank have you. agenda seconded uh, all those in favor of adoption of the agenda Say aye. 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 All right. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, agenda it will be as follows. Um, now, do we have uh, uh, acceptance of minutes? Uh, do we have a um, motion? Motion. motion Thank you. Motion for acceptance of minutes. Motion for. Motion. Yep. Seconded. Seconded. All right. Uh, has everybody been able to s read through the minutes from March 8th, 8th of 2021? And if so, uh, please say aye if you accept them. Aye. 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 All right. Minutes passed. Perfect. All right, so we've got next thing on our agenda here is the update on the Animal Safety Net Program rollout. So I will do my best to make sure I cover everything I know Caroline wanted to cover. I was going to talk most of this anyway. Um, so we have, again, continued to expand, continued to um, research and do different things. So we've been doing, um, we just kind of started last month or so, uh, found a foster. Um, Program. So folks that are finding animals in the fields, if they're willing to foster said animal, um, we will, we've been figured out a way to put it into chameleon so we can track that that animal is here with us um, or under our care, so to speak. It's now on our website to show versus just a found report on Pet Harbor or other places. Um, and then at the end of the stray hold, if they have not been able to reconnect with an owner, um, 
they can have first rights to adoption. And then we set up an appointment for them to drop off to spay neuter or whatever. One, one was already actually spayed. Um, so we just get all that taken care of. And once they're ready to rock and roll, they adopt and we uh, have been waiving the adoption fee. The only thing that they've had to pay for is a license um, at the time of the adoption. Um, been successful so far. It's been a little more labor intensive. It was a little staff was a little hesitant when we first rolled this out and we talked about why you know other groups are doing this type of program why it's beneficial to um staff in general i mean from everyone from field staff to care staff we're not having to go pick up animals and impound them they're not in the shelter less animals for us to have to care for um all those different things people were a little worried about it but when it came down to ultimately people are already doing this um without necessarily telling us about it. You know, they're finding an animal. I mean, I, if I found an animal could hold on to it, I sure, I sure would, you know, and no one would be worried about it or whatever, you know? And so we finally talked to people about, got them to kind of go, okay. And then it went from being, everyone was hesitant to, holy crap, it came back to like a handful of animals and found a foster and had to do follow-up calls and get appointments set up and follow in. And, you know, have you found an owner? No. Okay. You want to adopt? Yeah. Cool. Like, let's get all this set up. So it has blossomed. We With that, we also kind of simultaneously rolled out, more uh, expanded our like foster to adopt. So it was done on a very rare occasion before. And now we've had multiple instances of people being interested in a particular animal. Maybe they weren't the finder, but we've had a couple since we now have uh, 911 dispatches our officers. They hear about a lot of our calls. And we had a baby chick of all things that was picked up by its lonesome, a little baby chicken. And this gal really wanted to adopt it and it was on stray hold. So she took it home and fostered it and adopted it at the end of the stray hold. We didn't have to have it in the shelter. She had the equipment to care for it. Um, you know, and it was a foster to adopt situation. And same with another gal from the police precinct. Or she works in the, I think their HR or something she's adopting or fostering to adopt a dog from us right now. And so we've expanded that and gotten animals, you know, either out during stray hold or even post-surgery or whatever the case is. Um, and really have been flying with our foster stuff more which has been pretty cool but time consuming for me um trying to think animals say we have uh right now we have one dog excuse me two dogs in our um safety net program as far as in foster so we have a long-term one that's still miss josie with her puppies and the puppies are adopted um the veteran that's been in there he's hopefully getting an apartment in the next few weeks here so we hopefully after about eight months we'll be able to reunite him with his dog um, but we have another uh, gentleman that's dog is um, in foster care um, right now with a super awesome older couple that signed up over a year ago with their emergency thing. I've just been plugging in people and filtering out what they said they could foster and reaching out and going, you still interested? And nine times out of 10, they've said yes. Um, and if it fits, uh, we've been getting them set up with a foster, um, but trying to work on getting it where we have a more on deck type system so it's not individually each animal or time i'm having to reach out and go okay you said you could do kittens like all right i need kitten fosters where it's more you've now all had kind of the basic orientation or um whatever you know training type information get at least provided all that and you know we can get paperwork on file we've pared it down to it's like a one-time sign for a foster versus every time you have to sign your life away four pages long foster agreement um, that kind of just blankets it and things and made it a little more um, streamlined. Uh, so that's been going on. Um, I'm trying to think what else in Animal Safety Net. Uh, like I started mentioning before we started, we have Kula Yang, who is our urban scholar uh, intern for the summer. Um, she's helping us with researching different uh, rescue groups, like not just our rescue groups, like what do they do? Like it, some of them have programs that assist people in different situations. So we're trying to, from our already existing partners, um, get them, you know, what do they have to offer? So we already know about it. How can we link it better? Hi, Chris. Hi there. Um, we have been, um, having her also go through like looking up different what other like homeless shelters do we have in this city what or in the county what other programs or other places you know are there and trying to make more contacts in neighborhood groups and things like that so that's a big part of what cool is doing this summer um in helping us the stuff that we haven't had time to research and do and helping us kind of get that and maybe help us gain some of those connections and uh with that also kind of updating some of our website pages since it's migrated um some info has been lost or put in a different place so we're trying to make sure it makes sense and really is user friendly and really um helpful to folks when they're um trying to find resources or different things like that uh 
I think there is. Um, <laughs> we are still doing low cost vaccine appointments, so that's still been keeping us fairly busy. We have very regular requests for appointments for that. Um, people coming in and getting their distemper rabies microchip and then licensing. Uh, that's been ongoing and successful. We're still doing it two days a week, most weeks um, that we're able to or if we have enough requests for it, but that's been pretty steady um, that we've been able to keep people um, current and going on those things. I'm trying to think what else. Is there anything else that maybe we've talked about in the past that I didn't mention in this update for the safety net? Is there anything with the domestic violence angle of the safety net that's changed? Yes, uh, not really changed so much. Um, that's still uh, part of it. It's still the only thing that with some of the forms that we've gotten from other groups is we've kind of um, shifted it to the only thing that's on there is like it's like a 72 hours to get if they're not already in a program, which was before they had to be in a program already. If they're not already in a program. It gives them like 72 hours to get some sort of resources, you know, that to help them, because the big thing is making sure that they are doing things to obviously help themselves and that way we can help them with the pet piece and, um, you know, get them and the pet away from the dangerous situation that they might be in. Um, so I think that's about the only piece. I mean, it's still a lot of the situations are case by case um, as far as like what it's hard to define, obviously, sometimes what someone needs or how we can help them and how it fits into what we're doing. Um, we haven't had as many requests for, I mean, granted, it was always somewhat few and far between. Um, I felt like for domestic violence type requests, um, we've definitely had more on the side of owners in the hospital or, or um, this gentleman is facing homelessness and trying to find it. He has never had that or a job issue and this came up all at the same time and had nowhere to live and keep his dog safe and things like that. And so it's kind of been case by case too, just what, what fits you know, are they, what are they doing to get themselves in a better situation? And can we then support the pet side of it? And, you know, how can we work with that? Um, I know Animal Humane Society has opened up or started some also community-based um, assistance, different things, like they have their clinic and some other stuff. So they're doing stuff too. So that's pretty cool. They're actually listening, I think, to what people have said as far as is really needed in the area. Um, and have been able to refer some folks to utilize like their clinics for specialty stuff because they do it on a sliding fee scale now and have full vet services and different things. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of it's we're trying to really obviously not saturate the area. We want to make sure, you know, not have to do what other people are maybe doing and can help with, but making sure we have the information and at least knowledge of it to refer folks to those places and help them get the, you know, the help that they need. We've really taken um, more into the, as they call it now, instead of return to owner, return to home um, initiative and done more as far as, okay, what what will it take to get this pet back in the home if we feel it's a, you know, obviously a home that is safe for the animal, if there's not a concern of welfare or something like that, um, have really been going, okay, what, what can we do to get your pet back with you? We had a gentleman who had just had major brain surgery, had a traumatic brain injury. His dog had someone was watching it for him, it got out. He had a hard time finally they figured out, you know, connected all the dots, got about, and he couldn't afford hardly anything. So he was able to, we cut a deal and literally it was like license and rabies we had him pay for. And otherwise we waived all the kennel fees and stuff to get the dog home. And he was so happy and that, you know, it was an older pity. It, um, they'd been with him his whole life, all this stuff. And we, I think he had some minor medical, uh, but nothing, you know, but it was like, he was going to be a harder placement for us also. Um, and he was thriving in his home and was a very nice dog, you know, so different things like that has been, um, really the push that we've been, you know, keeping with is what can we continue to do to keep these animals in their home um, and continuing also with the managed intake. Um, with summer hitting, it's gotten a little busier um, with the people showing up at the door with different stuff. We have a crazy run on bunnies right now. I have no idea why. Um, people are dumping their domestic bunnies outside. We're literally at five right now. Um, but we've been able to have more conversations with folks about, you know, why are you, you know, surrendering your pet or do you feel you need to, is this the best option for your pet, you know, depending on what's going on, can we assist you with something or have you even tried, we had one gal to call that had adopted from a, one of our partners and I said, did you even call, did you call them and see if they would, because most of the time they'll take their pets back. She's like, no, I didn't. I said, would you be willing to? Yep. So that was an animal that didn't have to come into our shelter that was able to go back to the rescue that already knew it, that had already placed it and could do that and all those things. So we're continuing on with um, 
all those pieces and continuing to try to solidify it a little bit more as far as these are the things that we're we're doing and moving forward with. So any I feel like I'm sure I'm missing that something really here. awesome. I, I'm, yeah, I'm super ahead. excited about the um, about the programs that you have as far as the fostering and fostering to adopt and the finders fostering. I think that's super helpful. And I know you guys are like buried in paperwork right now trying to figure it all out. But once you get into the groove, I think hopefully it'll make it a lot easier for you. And I know it's going to be less stressful on the animals and more helpful for the mm -hmm. city too. So I think that's really good. Awesome job. Thank you. You've oh, done a Caroline, lot of work. Caroline's here. Yes, we are. <laughs> we are very busy. Um, I don't know yeah. how much I covered, Caroline, that uh, you might want to add to, but so go ahead, Heather. Um, is the uptick in rabbits, do you often see that after Easter? I mean, is this, Honestly, is this something that like comes around every year? No, I don't feel like it is, no. I've oh. never experienced too much of that in my sheltering years that we see this big uptick in Easter. And it's kind of honestly a little past the fact. You tend to, I feel like when groups have had it, it's been close, like not as far removed from right. Easter. Um, I think it's honestly maybe just resources. The last ones that came in this, this morning that I took in were apparently dumped in a carrier in the park. Um, I, I can't remember the other ones were, but yeah, we literally had, I think, two pairs and then one single tin. Um, and we've had folks that have just let them, they think they, or they just let them out thinking, oh, rabbits live outside, it's fine. But it's very clearly a domestic. Um, they look very different then, and they are not not equipped to care for themselves outside. So, yeah, I, I don't really know why the heck, but it seems like when we get weird things, they do come in runs. It's like we yeah. suddenly get 17 shepherds or we get 80 curries or something. It's like it's always yeah. weird. I don't know. <laughs> Caroline, what do you want to talk about with animal safety? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am. I really am apologizing. Um, what, what have you talked about so far? Uh, found a foster, um, managed intake, return to owner or return to home. You know, more focus that we've had on that recently. Um, foster to adopt, um, opening up a little bit more. Um, that was kind of, I think, most of my highlights there. So one of the things that we're really struggling with right now I'm sorry, I'm actually having to do this in my car. So one of the things we're really struggling with right now is um, finding a consultant to help us flesh out this program. And I don't know if you guys have any suggestions, um, partly because I feel like it needs to be somebody that is familiar with the animal human support services. And there's just not, it's such a new concept. Um, but we've set aside quite a bit of money to find a comp consultant to help us really get this moving. Um, and we're just not been able to use it. Where are you posting for the consultant? We haven't heard, it, we, we're just, we don't even know where to post. We, we, we're we just kind of at a loss, to be honest. I've reached out to Tawny Hammond with Best Friends to, it, and trying to catch up with her to get some feedback. Um, Best Friends is really caught up in this animal human safety services, or I'm sorry, support services, um, and to see if they can help us with this. I mean, we're doing a lot, but Danny and I are pretty tapped, to be honest. So, not to sound like a Debbie Downer here, because <laughs> there's a lot of exciting no. stuff going on, really, with it, but... It's great to have that position available, um, but finding the right person. I'll look and see if I have any uh, any information on where might be the best place to kind of search for somebody like that in the Twin Cities. Yeah, I'll get back with you. And it would be it wouldn't be a permanent position. That's the problem. It's it's a it's right. not even a position. It's just a consultant. And then um, I did develop a pet case care manager, kind of like a manager, like a nurse manager, but for pets. Um, and we have that position now the city but we're not ready to hire that because it's not we don't we're not permanently funded for it if that makes sense so that's that's something that we're kind of working on and, and it's uh it's been a struggle because we're we're trying to do multiple jobs we do have the um the shelter supervisor position not a veterinarian but an actual You're position for a shelter supervisor can you hear me Yes, but you're jumping ahead on my my agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> so that that's.
that's something that we that's something we could do some help with is, is figuring out that piece of it. Um, and I, I think this is something the board can really sink their teeth into this this whole program really and um, personally, but hopefully you guys are excited about it too. Yeah, this is one of the most exciting. Like, this is a this is a huge step for you guys because it is like one of the main components. I feel like Mac, uh, you know, could work on is this foster component and how to interact with the community. You guys have found a lot of different ways to do that over the years, and I feel like this is one of the most exciting like initiatives you've had. So nice work. It is, but you're breaking up. And they can agree. It feels like we've jumped off a cliff. I said something. It feels like we've a lot to keep up with, but we're we're managing right now. Thank you, Danny. It's all Danny. Could could you send us the um the posting or whatever you call it for the consultant? That might be helpful to know, like where well, to. That, yeah, we haven't posted anything yet. We're just still trying to figure out where to where to look and what we need. And, I think, but do we have the description kind of though, Caroline? I think we could send that, couldn't yeah, we? Yeah, we could send the description to them of, yeah. of what we're kind of looking for. Yeah. I yeah, think that'll make it a little easier for us to help you get. Okay. If yeah. we know what you're looking for. Right. We want a miracle worker. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, how's everybody doing? I see a couple of faces. Can't see past a recording. Doing good. Doing well. You're doing Doing good. And my face is burnt, so you only get my picture because you're face... sunburnt. <laughs> is that what you said? Uh, yeah, kind of. I started an acne medication, and I didn't realize it made you sensitive to the sun. So. Oh no. Yeah. Red in the A, probably. <laughs> yeah. There not fun. Yeah. No, 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 no. So with um, just off of this, uh, with Kula, or, or, or I'm sorry, is that how you say your name? Um, are you doing a, you're reaching out to homeless shelters and kind of like making a, like making a pact or I don't know, you know, a connection with them so that they know if they have a person that has an animal uh, where they need to go? Is, is that like? Is that what you're doing or what's the kind of. what's so right now she's just researching so far as far as where because honestly okay. I couldn't even tell you what shelters we have in the city as a, as someone that works for the city I couldn't even tell you what shelters are where they are and my my goal with her doing this research piece on these different shelters and like veterinary par partnerships and different things like that like getting this kind of all together um, and being able to go okay these are the people we need to contact and either a can we support them you know maybe help them do they know you know do they need resources for uh people that are utilizing their services like something that matt can do um to help them with their clientele and or you know help them maybe start allowing pets in or you know what i mean it's it's very baby at this point but it's like i don't even know who those folks are that might be even contacting us or might need to utilize our services that go i have someone that you know it's negative 30 out and they can have a bed for five nights but they won't because of their dog and okay that's something we can help with. Like they don't, may not, obviously, since it's kind of new to us, know that this is a possibility or that this is a, something that can exist or that we can make some sort of partnership and figure out is there ways we can work with each other um, and or on the flip side for folks that maybe come to us first, can we then help refer them to other places that might have resources for them for their needs? Um, so, so far it's been mostly just gathering that info and um, she's only been with us since the end of like literally what the day after like Memorial Day or something or not the week before Memorial Day is when she started. So we're still uh, starting to gather that. And then the goal hopefully will be to do some more reach out as far as, OK, here's connections or here's people we want to talk to. And that might be some from Kula. It also might be some that then Carolyn and I or somebody takes to start making those relationships. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the other thing piece of that is, can we go into these shelters where they do allow pets? And provide some free medical care, like like vaccinations, rabies vaccination, that sort of thing, to help people live safely with those animals. You know, to cover that piece of it. Okay. Any other things you want to add, Caroline, to the safety net update, or any question, other questions you guys have as the board on uh, that piece? I just think it's going 
swimmingly well considering um, the finite resources. And I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about bodies to actually manage the program. I think we're doing pretty good. And um, we're building something that's sustainable for the future, I think. Just gonna take time. And the community's embracing it. That's awesome. really, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, I had a lot of positive feedback. I mean, just the folks that took a dog for me recently for this program into foster. I mean, it could be three to six months. Um, and I'm like, even if it's just part of the time you foster, that's great. But they were, and even a couple of folks that weren't able to help, but I reached out about this dog. were like, this is so amazing that you're helping with this. Like I, we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback and people that were excited. Um, about this and because I, I was honestly I was a little hit with this particular dog you know I mean I feel like people have a stigma of you know well why was it why does a homeless person have a dog you know there's people that still think that way and it's you know I was afraid I would get some of that and I have not gotten any it was just been oh my gosh thank you so much for being willing to help this person and their pet and with the goal of reuniting them so that was that was nice because I was a little worried we might get some of the negative because that you know that's still out there and people still have those opinions or ideas or just don't know and um luckily so far have not run into that Yeah, my favorite piece is the found to foster program. I, I love love because I mean it keeps the animals out of the shelter. You know, they they languish in the system for five to seven days before we can even do anything with them. So to put them in our system, track, get them home to their owners, keep them in the neighborhoods they were found in, and if that doesn't happen, instantaneously bring them back to the shelter, sterilize them, either allow the foster parent to, to adopt or put them on our adoption portal without them having to languish for five to seven days. To me, it's a win, 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 win. Awesome. Well, if anybody, no one else has any questions, nothing else you want to add, are we ready to move on to the next um, piece on the agenda, which is the... March to May MAC numbers are reports, um, the standing info request. That sounds good. All right, do you guys want me to share my screen? Um, I mean, you all were sent this, but I can share my screen if that is easier for us as we talk through any questions. So I'll go ahead and pull that up. See if I can do this right. Let me know when you guys can see. Yep, um, I can see. Perfect. All right, so I guys uh, sent everyone the last three months prior post our last meeting, so March through May, so you can see our um, starting point in March, 21 dogs, 16 cats, total 37, all of our different intakes throughout the month, um, the live outcomes, what they all were, um, and then our final, uh, total outcomes awesome. and then I did throw in the live release rates at the bottom here. So March was March was a good month. April, a little higher population. Got some more animals coming in. Um, and now I feel like it's been a million years. Was it April? When April we looked like it was a little tough because the live release yes, rate went the live down. release went down and I did pull up I have I have to pull I did pull up uh, some of the info on that but I'm trying to remember if that was also because I'm just looking at our for some of the months we've been able to do you know more adoptions yeah. than transfers but the last few months at least two were flip flops um, the other way was April when we. Yes, it was. We we did evacuate in April again with the trial when we when we found out that the uh, verdict was coming, um, not knowing what would happen in our area. We did um, evacuate everyone from the shelter. And uh, so that's why there's a lot of those transfers and stuff too there. Um, but I know on this month when I pulled up the uh, reasons for euthanasia for dogs in particular, we did have two dogs that were destruct orders. Um, they had viciously maimed a couple children, um, and so they were ordered to be destroyed, and we proceeded with that. So we had those two. We also had another declared animal that was not one we felt we could place um, out 
uh, with whatever it had going on. So that was one of the euthanasias I know in that month. And then we did have an owner intended that's on there as well. I can't remember what that one was um, off the top of my head, but we did have a few that really with dogs that really pulled us down that month because of those um, euthanasias we did have to do because of those pieces. Yeah. And that then, makes sense. Yeah. And never easy. No, no. Um, and then May, looks like we got back down. We start, we got a little lower since we were able to uh, move a bunch out in April. And then we kind of started slowly going back up in May here. Um, but again, pulled back up with a better uh, live release rates for those months. And Looks like we finally got our adoptions back up in those months. I usually look at that and I forgot to when I first pulled these. So it looks like, yeah, we got our adoptions back up um, for the most part above transfers, except for in some cases. It looks like we had almost had a bunch of kittens. <laughs> um, but any other questions or anything on this info? Um, that looks like you guys are doing an awesome job with the live release rate. Really good job. I just want to highlight that good job um can you send me the information for all the animals that were euthanized and just the like we have been doing in the past just yes. so i can just look yep. over so these last three months yep yeah that'd be great thank you yep. anything else guys yeah so you're sending him the the um program that we designed so they get all the memos and everything correct whatever one that i have that's the best yes gotcha. i don't that's so, really flushed Adam, out, when you when you review that can you give me some feedback on what it looks like and okay if, if it's telling the whole story or not because you know that was one of our problems okay. I know that like I have had uh, you know we'd talked in the past about like trying to get the uh, trying to get the whole figure I have not had an issue with it um, it looks like you guys have cleared up how the records are but I can certainly uh, look over these ones and let you know if yeah, it, it seems as streamlined sure as I thought. from a layman's not that you're layman but from a layman's point of view if those records are told the story is told as to why we had to do what we had to do does that make sense okay yeah. Great, thank you. And seriously, there, good job. You know? Those are very beautiful live release rates. I'm so happy for you guys. Thank you. Yeah, that would be very beneficial. That's something that I've been really trying to make sure is right because that's that's the biggest thing I got out of that whole fiasco was the disaster. What it looked like, you got a, the perception. You know what I mean? It's like I knew I could sit there and tell you the story of each animal because I understood our system. But if you didn't understand our system. And it was pulled it looked pretty suspicious so i want to make sure that direct when we do pull those files people are getting everything i can say that in the past like these past like not this obviously not from march on but from before that uh it's been a lot more clear uh the records have been a lot more clear as far as this is yep. the behavior that the animal exhibited this is why you know we ended up electing euthanasia or having to euthanize um so I, it, it's it seems very reasonable to me good that's good, good. If Danny, if you want to send them to me too, I'll take a look at them from a truly a like Absolutely. outsider's perspective and and give you some feedback on that too. Awesome. That would be that's really great. You're on mute, Danny. All right, let's try that again. If there's not anything else on that, uh, are we ready to move on to the next uh, piece on the agenda? Okay. All right. Um, so I just wanted to touch base on um, working on the rescue meeting and a survey. Um, that was obviously on my forefront for a little bit there and got a little derailed. I have started making, or I have made up a uh, smart sheet uh, survey to send out to uh, rescues. I didn't. I don't think I got much uh, feedback from you guys as far as board, as far as questions and things to put on there. So I kind of put together what I had. I did have an, a volunteer that was interested. Look it over um, as far as what they thought. I'm happy to share that link with you guys. I do think there's a little tweaking that could be done to make it easier. But my my plan is to then send that out to them ahead of time. And in that, 
offer multiple dates for that versus trying to just pick some out of thin air and say this is when we're doing it and then whoever whatever majority is is when we'll schedule that and give them some time out so that is still on the docket to <clears throat> excuse me happen in the very near future here but just wanted to make sure that we got as many to attend um as we possibly can on there um yeah, if you would send that survey over, that would be helpful. I'm, I've dropped the ball on that one, so thank you. I would love to look it over. I'd yeah. be happy to look it over too, Danny. Okay. Yeah, me too. I um, And like Adam said, I apologize for not um, being a little more active uh, in my response prior to this. I did want to ask, um, I know Rachel Snee sent out mm -hmm. um, a survey, I don't know, last year to yeah. rescue partners. Did... Um, did we kind of um, piggyback off that at all or? Um... So the one, she, I have to look it up. I have it. I'll have to pull what okay. it was. I, I feel like it was more info finding because we were having trouble right. with a lot of folks getting us like, who's your current pick pullers? Who's the yeah. director? I mean, we still have some that even though I have people that contact us, like they don't have a director or they don't give it back to me or I, you know, or I haven't heard from them in three years. And then I suddenly get an email and it's a whole new person that I've never heard of. Um, so we're still struggling with that. That was a big yep. piece of it. And we definitely only had a partial response um, to some of those. Um, the other piece that I was thinking about adding or maybe um, doing in a separate type of thing would be I was I have to get a little more info dive into this a little more but I was told that due to our work with the board and train that there are groups now that won't pull from us or even read our emails and I have a feeling that has to do with rescue drama yes okay. um but I didn't know if that was maybe a bigger thing to put out elsewhere or not but um okay. um I I'm reading the the survey now and I can send this to you on the side if you prefer but we did get into a little bit of um uh information about like there one question says how can Mac be a better partner to you mm -hmm. how can how can Mac make it easier for you to say yes to more Mac animals is okay. there certain information then, mm -hmm. yep sorry go ahead as I say that's that's also mirrored in the same one another time okay. we're asking it again yeah okay and then is there certain information that you're looking for and is not provided and does your rescue have a specialty? Um, so Very I can. Did you a ever? A lot get, of what we're trying to get now. Okay. Did <laughs> so you, obviously, we didn't get much. <laughs> did you ever get the results of that one sent to you? Yes, I okay. did. Okay. Um. Sounds good. Okay. I guess I just my only comment or my only like recommendation on that was just going to be to avoid overlap. If we got a large response, I never looked through everything so i wasn't sure how many responded mm -hmm. um, yeah no it was not a big percentage i'd have to pull i do have it but i'd have to pull okay. to see what percentage we got um of actual okay. responses and some like we only got partial responses from i feel like when i remember looking through but yeah this was like about a year ago probably now okay i think maybe one way the board could help with that is i guarantee we're not going to get a ton of responses via email um, just because a lot of rescue people are already overwhelmed with so much to do, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I think one helpful thing, if you all agree that it wouldn't be too intrusive, is if we could also take the extra step to reach out via phone call to an individual, like either if we have a contact at a particular rescue or if we have a phone number on file for them. Um, I'm not sure if we collect phone numbers or not, but I think it would be a more personal touch that might get a few more responses. Um, and hopefully wouldn't take up too much time. That would be phenomenal if you guys could do that. And if we conquered and divided, I really don't think it would be too hard. Um, yeah, so, I, I know mean, we could start with the email and then maybe send a second email. And then if there's no response to that, then maybe we could um, make a couple phone calls again, just to show like we really care and we really yep. want this feedback and we want your involvement. Um, and this is important to us. So I know as an intake coordinator of a rescue, I know that that would probably get my attention. So. Okay. Certainly. Absolutely. Want to try. To I know, too. I know we did attempt a while back and maybe it's cause it was coming from other, it was not Carolyn and I or whatever. It was other city employees, but we we're trying to get um, some, roundtable discussions set up with some of our groups and a lot of them either wouldn't respond or refused 
to talk. So yeah, yeah I was, yeah. Uh, and that was again, hard. I'm, yeah, again, I'm not super surprised by that. Like a lot of these people are volunteers, so they already feel like they're at their max, yada, yada. But mm-hmm. um, again, I, and I don't know if maybe we frame the survey as coming from the advisory board so that they understand like, hey, we want to, mm-hmm. we want to, I, I don't know what the better option would be, but, right. um, but we want to, you know. Have a, have a partnership with Mac and the Max advisory board. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, a good explanation that this is a community board. I mean, it's, a, a, I mean, you are a community of people that are here to help guide us. You know. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I will send that out then um, to those of you that are looking at that, and then yeah, we can kind of figure out from there what we think would be the best tactics to proceed with that because it is definitely something we want to get back jump back into um and try to continue to maintain and hopefully at some point continue to expand some of our rescue partnerships um to you know get more animals out of here and really figure out and leverage leverage you know the resources we do have because i feel like there's times that maybe we are missing out because maybe we haven't taken the time to reach out to a particular group and i've been trying you know okay it's a whatever type of dog i'm going to reach out to this group because they probably don't read our emails every week because they don't often see, you know, this type of dog or whatever, you know. So trying to think creatively, but that also um, takes some more staff time and other things too. But, with, you know, the whole goal is to get them out. So we're trying to trying to do as much as we can. All right. Anything else on that? All right. Well, then we can move into. Oh, oh. Can I? Can I? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I kept missing my mute button. Um, one of the things I want to find out is how we can get them more engaged with some of these more difficult animals, because that's what's getting ling- that's what's languishing at the shelter. They're nice dogs, but maybe they have a little bit of a history, or you know, they just need a little bit more work. They're just not this perfectly adoptable dog right away. Yeah, and I think those will be really interesting conversations because. Um, in the survey that Rachel, the Mac volunteer, did via the Mac Playgroups email, mm-hmm. um, I noticed because I also have access to that email. So I read through a few of the emails or the responses just out of curiosity. And every single person that response that I saw said that they will not take an animal with bite history, um, just regardless of the explanation why. Um, and I assume that means both on dog and on humans because we see dogs who are human friendly but not dog friendly linger in the shelter. Um, but with that said, I also was asked to be on a, a panel with um, a bigger group uh, through Best Friends to talk about kind of how we are seeing the animal rescue industry transform into um, lo- better live release rates. But as a result of that, these really adoptable animals just being adopted out through the shelters and really those foster based partners needed for the quote unquote difficult animals, right? Animals with bite histories or, or that are a higher risk of a bite. And I think this is a, this is something that we are seeing industry wide where foster based partners aren't used to having to take bite case dogs or, um, or high bite risk dogs because they used to be able to get the cute and fluffies. Um, And so Having the, I think it's really hard for foster based rescues to have the training support for foster homes um, for those animals. And we're just not able to keep up with how fast the shelter industry is changing. So um, it's, it's in a way a good problem because these animals are getting a second chance, but it's also an issue that I think we're seeing around the U.S. right now. Yeah, I've heard that. Let me ask you this. Is there a training program, like a group that we could bring in? and offer free like a day of free training or you know something to our rescues to help facilitate not I, that's a really good question um not that i'm aware of i know this is a problem that we're struggling with at pet haven and it's not it's twofold one it's setting up a training program which means we have to pick a lane on what training philosophies we believe in right so we have half of the team who is like nope we only want to do fear free and then we have half of the team that's like No, we want to evaluate on the individual dog and kind of be open to different methodologies. So we're running into that. But then additionally, and the harder part is finding foster homes who are willing to kind of take on the risk of putting the work and time into these 
these dogs that, you know, most of them are large breed. Most of them are, you know, a little difficult. You can't have company over the way you used to. You got to do crate and rotate potentially. Um, and there just really aren't a lot of homes that are willing to do that. So be dangerous and ones are not making it out of shelters, I would hope anyways. Right, right. But I'm saying most fosters coming to us. So I'll give you one example. And this isn't necessarily a normal a normal foster, but the kinds of people that we're seeing, um, we had a dog come from a breeding situation. It was a golden, a pure bear golden retriever. And the foster who had fostered a couple dogs with us said, is the dog leash trained? My dog isn't. And I want to foster a dog who will leash train my dog. And so that's what I'm working with to some extent as an intake coordinator is I can't even get people who want to potty train or leash train a dog. So teaching a dog to not bite people is like completely beyond their their scope yeah. so you know we're, what i'm running into what i think i'm seeing anyways in our show I mean, we have a few problem dogs right but they're not horrible problem dogs and and a lot of times the problems really weren't the dog you know it was, right. it was the people that they were with and they're it, not in the situation anymore tan would be a good example of that yes uh, with that said, though, those dogs still do need a certain amount of management, and it's finding a home that's willing and able to do that. This is because they've already done the deed. And then supporting them. Heather has something, too. Well, I just wanted to say that when that we also ran into legal responsibilities as well. What what are the what are the. Um, ramifications if we place a dog in a foster home and then that dog does bite someone or bites another dog and we've had to pay medical bills and things like that. Well, what it, what happens if the the foster home then sues us? Do you know what I mean? There, there, th that's part of it too, and it is something that 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 you know when I was on the board of the Bassett Rescue, we we, we had to deal with. We had a dog that that bit somebody and we had to pay the hospital bills. Well, you know, it's fun to meet people that don't believe in euthanasia for any reason, and they'll say, oh, just disclose. But this is the stuff that sh that municipal shelters have been dealing with for years, and why a lot of these, they didn't take chances with any of these dogs for a long, long time. And and now we have to, or we, we're being asked to, and in some cases, I think most, I don't know that we haven't had a case that hasn't worked out, but, you know, maybe by the grace of God that it's worked out, and um. You know, I imagine it's a matter of time before some of us see some pretty good sized lawsuits with some of these dogs. You're, well, that yeah, is that actually, was, that, ahead, that, was our big, that was our big thing was that we, there were a couple of dogs we passed on because we had, we had had to euthanize two dogs in a fairly short period of time. And we're really worried about the liability. Yeah. Um, that was actually something now that, that just jogged my memory, kind of going back to the rescue thing is I was, and Megan, you might be a good one to help me with this. Um, but looking at, I wanted to kind of go back into our history, you know, our archives here of animals that we've had here and some of our challenge ones and do some follow-up with the group that, or the group, the rest, the grocery group that took that animal, that if it got pulled to see how it's doing. Cause I have heard anecdotally, some have yeah. done fantastic. And I've also heard some have not done so hot yeah. and have yeah. bitten after they left us or had issues or have been bouncing foster homes or can't be adopted or been returned or, and you know, and it, I would, for our knowledge, I feel like that would be maybe helpful on some of these that I've gone. I, I, there was red flags and I, I, in my gut said, this isn't, you know, probably yeah, not we where it should go. Dogs out that maybe wouldn't have gone out a couple of years ago. And, you know, and that's something I think the board is going to have to help us come to terms with at some point is creating a really good threshold of what, of where we cut it off. Yeah. And I know for me personally, again, and this is just me speaking as an intake coordinator, but as I evaluate dogs that I want to network with in Pet Haven, for me, it's whether that, uh, let's just call it aggression, but which I hate that word, but whether that aggression is defensive or offensive. So if a dog is, is offensively aggressive, and I think Sarge is the only, the, the boxer who had to be put down, I think he's the only one that showed offensive aggress aggression that I ever posted with Pet Haven. And that was just because he was so responsive to a strong, confident handler that I felt in the right home, he would be just fine. Um, whereas most dogs that I've seen show offensive aggress aggression, 
I feel like are kind of in their own world and they tend not to be rattled as easily by, by direction from a human. But again, for me, it's offensive or defensive. So if you corner a dog and they, and they bite you, well, you kind of, you kind of set them up for it and you kind of set yourself up for it. So to me, that bite is not the same as a dog charging at you and going after you when you did nothing essentially. I mean, you might have done something to provoke them in terms of putting them in a, a fearful situation, but you weren't, you know, cornering them or anything like that. They had so way, what you're saying, they had yeah. a way of, they chose to be off. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And for me, that's the dog that poses a danger to the community, right? A dog who is seeking out an opportunity for whatever reason. And obviously it's probably fear-based, but regardless, they're seeking out those opportunities versus a dog that is only going to do it if they absolutely feel like their life is in danger and they have no other choice. So that's a piece for me, but it's also they're you know, do they have any kind of bite inhibition at all? You know, yeah. you see some just when they do nail you, it's to the bone. Yeah. Well, and it's definitely not a black and white answer, but yeah. again, just for me, that's kind of the guiding, you know, line that I try to use. So, yeah, I think we're all kind of on the same page there. They're the, they're warning you or they're not, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. It's one thing to be warned and nipped. It's another thing to really, you know, I'm going to kill you. For so. sure. Um, but I do think that maybe this is something probably next term that we need to start really looking at and coming up with clear written um and i know it's not always black and white but there's certain things that maybe we just aren't willing to take on that liability and and we shouldn't our fosters to either you know for sure and um caroline i do want to make one final note i did like your question about what group is out there to help train people i did think of one thing after the fact um, follow, if you don't already, Dogs Playing for Life. They actually opened up a canine center in Florida, and I was going to try to get down there, uh, down to it when I was in Florida, and unfortunately, I didn't get over to it, but um, it's a really, really amazing center where they take dogs with severe bite history, and they work with them extensively at the center, and then a new program that they just opened within the last six months is they're now transferring those most difficult dogs to professional trainers to continue one-on-one -on -one work in the professional trainer's home, and they will transfer them anywhere in the U.S., so these dogs are going from Florida to anywhere else, and I wonder if they might have some opportunities. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or, or just insights, or I'm sure other rescue groups are pinging them, but they are seeing really great success. Um, their most famous one is um, uh, Hansel. He was a pit bull with pretty severe bite history, and they ended up working with him so much that he's now an arson detection dog, and he's, like, super famous. So um, they've had a lot of, of success. They are not a fear-free trainer, um, which some groups are going to have issues with, but um, they believe with those more difficult dogs, they need a little more structure and a little more direction. Um, and they use basically techniques on a case by case basis, uh, based on what the individual dog needs. So I, I absolutely love their program. Um, and if we could get them up I here, that would be great. Life, and I think it has saved a lot of lives at Mac. That's for sure. For sure. And, um, you really haven't had anything horrible, horrible that I'm y'all let me know anyways. Of. Yeah, no, we haven't. Um, so yeah, I don't. I don't know if they're going out to speak to groups yet. I think it's a fairly new thing, but they're the only one that I know of who's doing what they're doing. So in terms of taking those really difficult dogs and saying, bring it on. Well, you know, part of the Animal Safety Net program is to, is to have the support out there in the community so that we can save more lives, right? And it's, I, I can see this being part of the program to help support our rescues. Um in other shelters, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. So maybe we can find figure out a way. I'll have to. I'm, I'll noodle that in my brain for a while. It'll come to me. Okay, that's all I had on that, Danny. Unless anybody okay. else. I'm oh, sorry. I don't mean to hijack you. All right. Well, the next piece was just a reminder. Um, board term for this group is up June 30th. And for those of you reapplying, the deadline is tomorrow. Um, I know there's been some questions on it. So if you have any questions, let me know and I can try I to- I do have a question. Through that, yeah. On the um, on that website, it says that there's a two, there are only two terms that are allowed. Uh, and I just wanted to confirm it because I went to apply and I was like, I'm not even eligible really. 
Um, no, we do not apply. We don't have term limits for Mac. That's I think almost all the other groups do. OK, but my Mac understanding is unique. yes. We're very we're, unique, Adam, because we're the unicorn. Pseudo, yeah, we are. We're pseudo under. I mean, we're not really under the city council so much as you think we are. So we're kind of unique for the group for the advisory board. That is. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's okay. a weird weird thing to be in. It's a good place for us, you know, but it it's a little odd. It it, it keeps politics out of it, um, and that's the piece. That's why I want to maintain that control. Um, technically, Kim appoints. You know, I recommend, and then Kim appoints, and then we send it to city council to our committee, and they, you know, do their thing. But it's not. You don't have somebody putting their best friend on our Mac board that really has no business being on the Mac. You know what I'm saying? I probably shouldn't yeah, say that. that was, and that was an <laughs> issue in the past, so I do appreciate that. Yeah, so we, we just let it, you know, let sleeping dogs lie sometimes. Um, okay, I understand, okay. I know that there's a few people that aren't interested in joining the board for returning. And um, for those of you that aren't, I'm just cannot extend the amount of gratitude that we have. You have made a difference, even if you maybe feel like through COVID it's been pretty boring, probably, but. If it wasn't for this board particularly, um, we wouldn't be where we are with our live release rate. You guys really, really helped me work through a pretty serious uh, situation and um, fix some problems that we didn't even know we had. So thank you. You have made a difference. And don't ever let anybody tell you differently, including yourself. Aww. I mean Thanks, that. Sarah. That's heartfelt. And... Uh, you know, and the other thing, if you're not interested in being on the board, would you like to create a 501c3 Friends of Mac group that can get grants for us so we can hire all these positions? I can't do it, and neither can any of you. <laughs> I've already done that, and I have no interest in doing it. <laughs> really, that's competition. <laughs> That that's that's on my agenda to do and be, before I retire. Anyways, I'm gonna figure out how to get that done. Uh, do we have any people um, that have applied for the board for the future? I don't have the exact numbers, Danny. Have you seen the exact numbers? I think I. So we have the handful that we had from last spring, okay. which I think we're gonna have to follow up with Caroline and see. I don't know if they are eligible still now that we have a term turnover or if like if they're still on the I don't know how that works um, I do know I've seen at least one maybe two for sure one new applicant to fill a vacancy from this more recent posting um, a current volunteer I think she'd be good um, she hasn't been able to physically come in and do as much as she used to after she actually got COVID and just had a lot of some uh, of the ongoing issues so she hasn't been able to come in as much but i think she would be very good on the board um but that's the only one i can remember that was a newer applicant from not ones that we'd sent out okay so if you remember when we when we had a few resignations we were in the middle of the shelter review which i think we probably should still take up whenever we i still want to have best friends come in and do do that you know physically actually be in the building but yeah um we didn't want to upset the apple cart you guys were working so well together you remember so we just didn't fill those positions um which is you know fine i think we did just fine especially with covid but hopefully we can get every every position filled this time and not chase you away All right, sorry, uh, just making a couple notes. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, just Caroline thanked us. I don't know if we could say thank you enough on the work that you guys have done. It's really, it's, it's you that implemented. And um, so, yeah, we were happy to obviously work on the uh, assessment, but I mean, holy shit, you guys have just done an unbelievable job. So thank you. It's crazy. I appreciate yeah. that. But you I guys, I, I meant that when I said, and I really, my staff are the ones that are that are owed that i just was crazy enough to pull some plugs but um i couldn't have done it i really and you know i had moral support and kind of held me up when i was about to collapse under some of the stress but 
also, I know that probably politically, a few of you have, have jumped in the ring for me. So I really, really, really appreciated it. And um, hopefully we will we'll keep reaping this reward. And we, I think we've, we've laid the foundation for something, provided the city doesn't just decide to get out of the world of animal control and animal sheltering. But I think we've laid the groundwork for something that's unstoppable, to be honest, in Minneapolis and, and, uh, and beyond, you know. So I'm super excited. And it's I didn't get in the business to kill dogs. I can tell you that when I first started this, I wanted to save everything. My first dog I ever picked up was a feral and I had her for 19 years. So that dog gave me, she gave me the worst run for my money getting her on the truck than any animal I've ever picked up in the 25 years that I was out there. And <laughs> Daisy, I had, I'll show you all pictures and we get there in person. Bless her heart. She, I just got her ashes, by the way. They, <laughs> went through my divorce and they got stuck down there in Virginia and they called me like, do you want the ashes of this dog we cremated for you? I'm like, Oh my God, you still have them. And I paid to have them shift up here of this dog, but 19 years, this feral dog lived with me. So that should tell you. So this was uh, a dream come true for me to get to this point. And I don't think I ever thought I'd see it in my lifetime. I knew we were building the foundation, but I didn't know that I'd see it. And thank you guys for that. And, and I think my staff, I don't think they're ever going to let it go back either. And that's that's what's really important is you've, you've left a legacy behind here. You really have. Really amazing. I'm going to start keep crying. Our, keep our feet to the fire. Keep us going. They yell at me. I'm becoming a hoarder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, and that's the amazing thing is we really aren't. Our, our numbers inside the building are actually lower than they were before when we were euthanizing more. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And I know that you guys have some long-term like keepers. You like you have some animals that stay there a lot longer just because they are harder to place. But you've done an excellent job networking those dogs. Like I can't uh, I can't remember the name of this black uh, black and white dog that Monty. Yes, Monty. Yeah, you guys have been really working hard for Monty. Monty's getting his list is getting shorter though. We got to find. I Monty. know. I know. We just can't let them suffer, you know. And that's when they starts to play you know play on their brain and they're starting it becomes inhumane to keep them in this in the shelter it's just tough i know I but know. no one can say that you haven't done everything that you possibly can for mm -hmm. that dog because you've offered 250 dollars uh he's gone to board and train he's done lots of different things cute and pictures i don't and know he's why very, they, yeah i don't know why they're not taking him he's really actually a neat dog so thank you for what you're doing for monty and all the other dogs like him Oh, we're going to keep trying. We'll just keep trying. That's the thing is you got to think out of the box. And, and between Danny and I, and then you start throwing in the rest of the kennel staff, it gets, the box is really crazy. But we're thinking. Do you ever box. think about working with a prison? Hmm? What? Yeah, I have. I have. I, I, when I first started, they actually approached me. I've thought about it. I did my um, uh, master's thesis on that, so I I have it all set up already in you know on paper. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, well, there's like, a program well. in Minnesota, <laughs> right? We can supply them dogs. What are you talking about? Come on. Yes, yeah, there there are a couple of programs. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, some of them won't take this whole black dog, which is ridiculous. Aww. Dumb. Yeah, well, it also might be different if it's coming from a city, you know, versus like a just a general rescue. I don't know. Yeah, we've even had a few dogs that really aren't necessarily candidates for um, anybody, <laughs> but they're nice dogs, you know, like Malawas and stuff that are just really intense, you know. And we've tried to get them in with police departments. I think we've had some success with that, but not. That really would make, I mean, they've got some special talents, but they're maybe a little bit too intense for the general public. And um, I know we've got a few. We've had, I think, airport police and other police departments and mm -hmm. other groups that have come to evaluate some of those dogs that are a little, yeah, intense is a really good way to put it. And again, kind of <laughs> another option because they're, they're the ones you're going, I'm going to see you right back in that door in about five days <laughs> when they're going, oh, my God, what did I take yeah. home? But, Do you know what's amazing is M Minneapolis. You know, I've worked with police departments that would take, they walk through with a rag rolled up. Have you ever seen this? And you run it past the kennels and any dog that could hold it, 
that would hold its attention on it for 30 seconds, they would take them. <laughs> Those were trainable dogs that were great drug dogs often. And uh, it didn't matter the breed, but Minneapolis will only, they, they import all of their dogs from like Germany. All of them. Unnecessary. I know. I agree. All right. Well, anyways, you guys got your reminders. Get those of you reapplying. Get it in by tomorrow. Um, hiring update. That's the next, Caroline. Okay. Um, are in the process of hiring off. No, who are we hiring right now? No, we're opening up um, the CSR position. It is open. Yep. That open and um we're replacing although there's going to be some information that we do need to talk to you guys about with with regards to opening the shelter on the weekends i'm having my that's my the next piece and then um we have requisitioned um the shelter supervisor position that's probably going to be open up in a couple of weeks um and that is different than camille's position this is somebody that um, is not a veterinarian to manage the actual shelter operations. Um, I want to keep shelter operations and veterinarian services separated, which was the original intent of um, the, when we did the restructure, that was actually a separate unit. So this, this, um, for now, the veterinarians are going to be under me. And the purpose of that is... Um, I want to, Maybe you should fill uh, them in that we have a second one now. Oh, yeah, I forgot. We have a second veterinarian getting ready to get hired. Her name is Jennifer um, Ashby. Is that how she pronounced her last name? I you could tell you. Know. Super nice girl. She she was born and raised in Minneapolis, in North Minneapolis. And she's, like, ready to give back to the community. I'm super excited about her. Um, so second full-time vet starting in July. By July 19th. I'm sorry, Danny. Um, Julie just distracted me with some salmon. But <laughs> let me just be honest about it. But um, and then um, I, the shelter supervisor, I've got I've created the position um, of the pet case coordinator, but I've been asked to hold off on hiring that. And like I said, they want us to do a court uh, a consultant first. Um. And then, of course, um, we're going to ask for that position for next year. And we're also asking for, I believe, another officer position next year. Which we did just hire semi-recently an officer. I can't remember what position was open. Oh, yeah. we, we have a recruit right now. That and we was... filled our second part-time ACT position recently as well. Who filled that? Paul. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. So Mac is at almost at full staff from where we were before COVID. Just so you know, it's great. Um, still don't have enough staff um, as far as keeping up. You know, we're just it's hard to keep up, but but we're getting it done. And um, the the hardest, the biggest problem that I see right now with the public safety initiative that's going on. Um, Mac is part of that. Um, of taking off some of the calls that MPD is doing and they're looking at ex uh, expanding us to a midnight shift seven days a week, three shifts, which is a significant amount of officers. Um, and I'm con my concern is the shelter being, you know what I'm saying? It, those officers need support staff. So that's the piece that I'm trying to figure out. I don't know if it's going to happen, but it's something that they're talking about. Because currently MPD runs about 7,000 calls for us after hours. Um, and these aren't the calls that we, we go out on. These are on top of that. So it's kind of a waste of their resources, to be honest. So they're looking at how, how do we reroute some of those calls that they really don't need to be dealing with. Um, so there's a lot going on. I think we did a really good job managing through COVID and through the recession as far as the business side of Mac and ensuring that the powers that hold the purse strings understand the importance of what we're doing and why it's important for the community 
and for public safety and health. So, did I miss anybody, Danny? I don't think so. I think that's. Um, so that brings us to security at MAC. We are currently in a very stressful situation. We, can we talk about stuff offline, Danny? No. Okay. So, so with the officers being dispatched um, by 911, there isn't any officer in the building on the weekends anymore. And it means that there may be just one CSR and maybe a kennel attendant at times. That's all that's in the building trying to manage through a Saturday. So until we can get that resolved, the security issue that we're dealing with, we are not going to reopen on the weekends. And I know that's not conducive to where we're going, but that's just where we're at. We're currently in a situation where Mac is has some really serious security threats, and we're looking at um, getting security guards, possibly armed security guards at Mac 24 hours a day. And that's that's where I'm going to leave it so you know that it's not a good situation. Um, what kind of threats uh, are you guys receiving that you think that armed security guards 24 hours a day are necessary? Um, it's about the type of indi the individual that we're dealing with. I can't talk about it in a board meeting. Okay. Is it just one person that you're worried about or is it just in general you feel like there are giant threats? We're in a climate right now that's not very safe. We're in an area that's not very safe. There was two homicides right across the street from us just like a couple of days ago. Um, we've been People have tried to throw bricks through our windows. We had somebody rob us a couple of Fridays ago. And what? We, have, we have two individuals that are of serious threat, serious enough that the city is actually considering the armed guards. And you know that goes over like a lead balloon. Sure. Uh, mainly to, or at least a guard, to be out with, with the kennel staff when they're out exercising animals, and then to make sure that no one can come into the building unless they have an appointment right now. We won't be reopening like normal for a while. But that said, it's actually gone really well. We're, we're doing better this way than we were when we were open. So we can control the flow, which helps control security to a degree. And um, people get better customer service while they're in there and we can actually spend time counseling people on the animals they're adopting so we're getting better homes or better partnerships with the you know what i'm saying okay and it's like that's the i guess that's the part that i'm like a little bit surprised on like the you are probably more closed down than you ever have been before as far as you know just random people being able to come in and do you know if, if there's any sort of security threat uh, so it's just surprising <laughs> What happened? So somebody, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really not funny. It's awful. I'm really well, sorry that that happened. You guys, what happened? If you see a blue bone anywhere in Minneapolis? Could you let us know where it's at? Somebody came a in. Bone? A giant wood bone that maybe collected donations. That oh was like, yeah. Five hundred dollars, probably twenty dollar bills in it. But it. Um, oh no. Yeah. So they took that giant they, bone. They, they broke it open. No, they took the whole damn thing. That's bold. Was it we well, like, guys, was anyone we were, in the building? Yes, yeah. it was during regular business hours. Um, they, oh my God. they had been in there earlier in the day and they came back. The guy comes back and he said, Hey, I got my friend with me. I'm I'm pretty sure his dog is here. And so they let him in because we're really not turning people away too much at the time. And the guy, while she was dealing with one, the other one snatched the damn thing and ran out the door. Fortunately, they didn't have any guns. And fortunately, the officer that was up front, who's pregnant, and the officers are a little crazy. So at first, she went, kind of went after him. And then she got, you know, halfway through the lobby and went, what the hell am I doing? And stopped. But, you know, here we are. 
Oh. That's not why I want. We want the guard, though. <laughs> But I'm just, so glad that you guys are, are are okay in that situation, especially with how the climate has been in where your your the offices are, um, where that climate is. That that was the worst that that happened, and I definitely think armed guards there makes so much sense, especially in this climate. So I just appreciate you guys, and that nothing worse happened because oh, it is constantly in that area. It is constantly in that we're in a terrible spot and I just, I need my staff to be safe. I need them to feel safe. I mean, let's face it. What the work we do is, is dangerous inherently with some of the people we have to deal with, but it's gotten a lot worse. We had a guy, this is one of the reasons we're having problems. We had a guy that um, literally released his dogs on my officers in the field. Luckily they were able to thin, thin the dogs off. Um, he's now wanted for murder. And we now have his dogs in the building. So, um, and there's some other stuff going on with him. And then there's another guy that just got, it's just a lot of stuff going on. And we're getting caught up in the middle of it. We're okay, though. Well, I'm glad that you guys are trying to find solutions. And I am glad that right now you're still on managed and take as far, or, you know, as far as letting people into the building. Just because that does give you a degree, you know, of safety uh, that you didn't have before. It does, but one of the things we really do like about it that we've been considering anyways, we've talked about it, even without this stuff, is that we can now counsel people. Before, you come, you, know, you open the door at 1 o'clock, and everybody and their brother shows up, and it's, it's a mad. People were able to walk out the door with dogs in their arms sometimes. I mean, they've had dogs stolen because we just can't watch everything. Now you don't have people going in the back in the kennels, you know, wandering aimlessly through. You talk about liability. You know, having people bring animals out on their own and stuff is insane. And then, um, you know, we're able to sit down and say, you know, let's talk about your family life. What is it? You know, are you, do you, do you, are you sedate? Do you like to sit on the couch or are you a runner? You know what I mean? And help them find the right animal for them. And I think that's why we've had so much success with the ones that we have gotten adopted. Yeah, no, I, I've heard from our staff. I mean, not only are they less stressed, too. We don't have 40 people staring at them at 1 o'clock going, I want the X, Y, and Z. Um, we have our multiple animal permit people come in. I mean, some of them have, you know, 20 cats they need to license, and they bring and they come every year, and then they've got all the people angry behind them because they have to wait a half hour for us to process all that. Um, so they're like, we hope you stay with this for this because it was so much less stressful for us and you. Um with yeah, adoption well, appointments, we uh, can call and do some counseling ahead of time, especially with some of the ones that we know are harder. We can literally, they are able to then talk about, okay, this is what we know. Like, do you have kids or what, you know, whatever our concerns might be or whatever the, you know, or go, hey, this dog is needing a lot of training and exercise. And when they go, oh, no, I want one that's, you know, potty trained and leash trained. Well, this is not the one. Let's talk about so-and-so. Tila's been doing an amazing job of making sure even though she doesn't get to necessarily always meet all of them she tries to read up and know about them so she can call and go okay this is what i know about these guys and this is what you're telling me and sometimes we're able to do that even before they walk in the door which is helpful because once they've seen one in in person half time it's i love it even though it maybe isn't a good fit i mean sometimes they go okay maybe not but there has been a ton of bonuses benefits to this by adoption it is hard 311 is short-staffed people have to call and then we have to call them back and some people get frustrated um you know with it but overall in general we've had more positive feedback and not having to do drawings when everyone wants that cute fluffy poodle has been oh. amazing yes chris go ahead oh sorry i i didn't want to cut in but i just i just wanted to share some feedback and I, so i get the security concerns i get the appointments and the ability to to counsel which i fully support so i i just want to be sure i preface that by so that nobody thinks this is a criticism, but it's feedback that I've shared before. So, and I'm also not speaking for the whole rescue community. I'm speaking strictly for the rescue crew. It, it, it is harder for us because having a limited amount of intake people with being volunteers and limited hours available, I, like I myself, you know, this is all that I do, but my schedule is such a nightmare that I'm not able to just come by. I haven't assessed a dog since COVID started. I mean, I hate that, not being able to come in and just be able to spend some time in the volunteer room to be able to assess dogs. So it's much more harder for us um, to be able to come in by needing to make an appointment. Like our intake manager, you know, works one to five. So she was able to get there today to pull a dog before you guys closed. But she's she'll only tag a dog that she feels confident that she's going to be able to take herself her place. 
because she can't get in there to assess a dog. Cats were able to pull because, you know, a- again, what I'm pulling, unfortunately, right now are usually the adoptable ones, which I don't like doing, but it's difficult for me to be able to get in there to try to meet the ones that are rescue only. Um, so that's just feedback. And I will say, and maybe it's just hypothetical, but it does seem that lately you've had more animals in need from a rescue perspective. So maybe that is impacting rescue's ability to get in there and take some. I don't know. That's only my perspective. I hate the fact that I, and it's selfish that I can't come in there to assess and network the dogs. Okay, Chris, that's good feedback though. And and I don't consider that criticism at all. Um, I think that we can find workarounds with that. So let me, Danny, think about that. And you know, maybe if we have specific hours that are open to rescues to just come in. Yeah, I think now that COVID is not as much of a concern as in regards to different restrictions lifting, that was a big piece for also having rescues to appointments. I mean, I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't. I'll bring hmm? I'll <laughs> if you show us that you've had both, you get two free animals. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Like a oh, I'm throwing four. Four for you. Oh, the, ooh, wow. <laughs> all friendly and they all have their teeth, too. Oh, here I'm. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I just want to be uh, more and it's just much more difficult for me to do it. Yeah, I think I think we can probably loosen up on some of that now with the COVID stuff. I Weekends, though, is still going to be, I think, hard because, like Caroline said, we literally have right now two shelter staff in the building maybe an officer that's bouncing around if we're lucky and they can't be at the front door they can't be there to buzz you in they can't we just we don't have the staff in so I mean, obviously have, security with the rescue is not a huge thing but so we hopefully. had people from each rescue like two people from each rescue that were also volunteers at mac could they not get badges to be able to badge themselves in yes they could if they were also a volunteer yes so we could put that in like if they wanted that ability we could put that in the rescue agreement they wouldn't really have to do i didn't have a badge Uh and most people were surprised to find out i didn't have a badge anyway since i used to just come in there and act like i own the place but (laughs) you do own the place chris don't you know (laughs) Uh, um but i mean seriously i don't see why you'd have to go through a background check but you we can control when you can open that door. <laughs> so, you know, as long it could easily be set up so that they could, as long as they were volunteers of Mac and they signed all the agreements, they could go look at dogs on their own. They don't necessarily need a kennel tech with them, right? Right. We've allowed the that. The difficulty for that is. Yeah, the background check um, and then having to go in, you have to go into a specific one place in the city to get the badge. It actually takes, it's actually like quite a big deal. Uh, Okay, because I was going to say, because that's not really, I mean, you hope it's going to be fast, but it's not. Yeah, I know. They're a pain in the butt. We're trying to work. It's even worse now. We're trying to figure out how to get Danny or I to be able to take the photo and then just send it to them. Because we're doing the background. Yeah, that would be ideal. And then they can just mail it to us. No, they're never going to mail it to us. We're going to have to go pick it up. Go down and pick it. I know I messed up when I said that. Yes, I yeah, no. But if we have batches versus one at a time, that'd be great. Yeah, so we're trying to figure that out because I do not think that is very inclusive the way it's set up right now as far as the badge. Like, it's great once you have it, but that piece is a big piece to the volunteer access and is not an easy piece to do for a lot of folks. Yeah. And God forbid Thanks you break for your badge. That. It's a, or lose it. No, that's actually usually easy. It's the matter of the person getting down there for the first time. Yeah, whatever. Anyway. Yeah. Trying to see how we could make that easier. When I first started, they had all these. What were they? I don't even know what those badges were called, but they had numbers on them or something. Jeanette used to have them in the office. Yeah, we were lost. We didn't even know existed. And people could get in and out of that building. And and the week, all of those were cut off. And it's been much more secure to have the volunteers have their own badge that says, "I'm I'm a volunteer with a picture on it than it was to have a bunch of visitor passes. Now, if you want a visitor pass at Mac, you have to give them your firstborn child and, you know, we put it in a box. You don't get the child back until we get our badge back. <laughs> so, and then we're going to chase them down and hand them back. Heck no. I, really I have my own. I don't need more. So, um, it's, All right. But it works. Um, so, yeah, Chris, I think we can work around that for you and make your life better. 
Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Much appreciated. Anything else on security? No, I just, I, you know, there's just a lot going on in the city right now. We're just trying to make, keep our people feeling safe and be safe at the same time and not get caught. We've had a couple of times where we've almost gotten caught in the middle of drive-bys where the officers are out there in the field. And um, I mean, like literally they pull away and somebody starts shooting. So it's been um, just, it's a real crazy time right now. We're, we're working through it and the city's going to be better for it, but it's just a little, it's a little difficult to maneuver in right now. And those of you who are living in the city understand what I'm talking about. So, and then they're wearing badges and stuff. So it just makes it a little harder. You know, police officers aren't well liked right now in the city. Bless them. TMI. Anyways, um, okay. So is there anything else you, you guys have or? Yeah, that's the end of the agenda. Does anyone else have anything, uh, any addendums or anything? I do not. Nope. All right. Well, if no one has anything, I've got the follow ups that I will do the sending out of stuff that uh, everyone asked for and we talked about. Um, otherwise, if we have nothing else, we can have someone move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All right. Well, you've got an adjournment thing to read, Ben, your last one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> If no other members or staff have any other matters to come uh, before the end of the meeting, um, if no objection, and uh, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Ben, for being our leader. Yes. This is yeah. the last time we're going to see you, right? Yeah, it, it is. Um, but I will always be um supporter of mac and and everything that you guys are doing and it's really been a great honor you guys um just thank you really think what you guys are doing is is really amazing and i've loved to be a part of it um, hey ben so. can, you, can you forward danny your new address I, I absolutely will right now i don't have a strict moving date okay you just know that it's a card you know what's that send us a postcard <laughs> We'll send you a Christmas card. That's <laughs> awesome. I would love it. All that right. would be amazing. So I still want to do a calendar with all the firemen, but <laughs> all right, meeting's been adjourned. We have to cut Thank off. You. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you, ben. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. And and you've been just a huge asset to the city and to this department. I really can't. I mean that. Well, yeah. Thanks again. And yeah. like I said. It's been wonderful to work with all of you. You're all amazing. So, yeah, we we uh, we have uh, thoroughly enjoyed you, and you've done a wonderful job. Well, thanks. It's definitely been an honor for me. So, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll always be following what you guys are up to and uh, the amazing things that you guys are doing. So. I appreciate that. And if you're back in Minneapolis, please, please, please stop in and say hello. You bet. But whether we're open or not, you can ring that doorbell and say <laughs> Yeah, I'll make an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. that's one of our biggest complaints is how long it takes 311 to answer. So that's something we're trying to figure out, too. So, is that you at the top? I can't see past the you've joined a meeting that's being recorded. Yeah, I don't know, but I need to end the recording, so I have to have everyone exit before I can oh. close it. Ah, okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.